Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode in Caserta's Data Intelligence Webinar Series. I'm your host, Remy Rosenbaum. And today we're going to actually have a special episode. We're going to talk about how data is your organization's best defense in a crisis. Now, I'm not talking about how to leverage a terrible pandemic um, where people are losing their lives to, to use your business advantage, rather how your organization can use data to navigate these choppy waters in order to keep the lights on and the food on the table for your colleagues and their families. In today's episode, we have an excellent presenter, the man who gave us the three Vs of big data, the father of Infonomics and Caserta's <laughs> very own principal of data and analytic strategy, Doug Laney. Mr. Laney is a best-selling author and recognized authority on data and analytics strategy. He, he advises senior IT business and data leaders on data monetization um, and valuation, data management and governance, alternative data, analytics best practices, and information innovation. Uh, a bit of housekeeping and then we'll get started. Uh, Caserta's complimentary data analytics webinar series is designed to give you insight into today's hottest technological trends and issues. And after today's webinar, I encourage you to speak with to speak with us uh, about any questions on how to apply uh, what you've learned today at your organization. Our initial consultations are always free, and if we find an opportunity to work together, then we can discuss next steps. And if not, we'll gladly point you in the right direction. And after the webinar, I will send each of you a recording to the email address you provided. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them in the questions panel on the right, and we'll answer them during the live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Doug, take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Chicago, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I do hope you and your families are all, all safe and well. So, you know, um, what college basketball announcers would be normally uh, saying during each game this time of year, they'd be saying something like, you know, the best offense is a good defense. Well, at the moment, you know, I think we, uh, we really need to flip that script. While most organizations are going into a defensive posture right now, we at Caserta believe there's really good reason for, for you and your team to you know, set some picks and, and, and take, it, take it to the hoop. Um, so this isn't the, the first crisis like this. So let's take a look at uh, another one decades ago for a little perspective and, and inspiration. Over three and a half centuries ago from 1665 to 1666, the Black Death ravaged Europe and in London, over a quarter of the population would die of the, the plague. But in order to temper the, the tragedy, many institutions decided to institute a, a practice that you know, today we're calling social distancing. So this isn't something you know, incredibly new. Uh, this included a, a particular prestigious university some 60 miles north of London, the University of Cambridge. And just as many of our kids, including my son who is at Vanderbilt, are now sheltering and studying at home, one particular mediocre math student decided to spend his time quite productively. And in, in fact, during this time, he, he invented calculus, the uh, law of gravity, uh, and the breakthrough theories on optics. And then returning to Cambridge in 1667 with his theories in hand, a young Isaac Newton was made a fellow and then uh, a couple of years later, a professor, um, probably without any regard or you know whether he even you know changed out of his pajamas or or uh, or bathed before noon while while working for home. So some quick thoughts on on calculus. I know there there won't be a quiz, but today calculus has become a really an indispensable tool for professionals in in almost every industry. Physicists use calculus to find the center of mass of a more like a sports utility vehicle to design appropriate safety features that adhere to federal uh, you know, government specifications on different road surfaces and, and at different speeds. Uh, biologists use differential calculus to determine the exact rate of growth in a bacterial culture when different variables such as temperature and, and food sources are, are changed. Um, banks, of course, use calculus to set the minimum payments due on credit card statements at the exact time the statement is processed by considering multiple variable, variables like um, uh, changing interest rates or fluctuating uh, available balance. 
And um, doctors and lawyers even use calculus to help build the discipline necessary for things like solving complex problems or diagnosing patients or, uh, or even planning a, a prosecution case. Of course, epidemiologists uh, rely on calculus to determine how far and fast the disease is spreading um, and where it may have originated and from and, and how, to best, uh, how to best treat it. So calculus basically is the tool to calculate the rate of change of something according to you know, something, usually time. And since literally everything is, is always changing and, and everything, you know, it, basically everything has to do with calculus and, and so, you know, boy, are, are times changing now. Um, so even when calculus formulas are, are known, um, new variables and new data um, will emerge. But you know, there can be a bottleneck between the collection of data and the analyzing stages of, of that data, especially in times like these where there's a, a real significant desire to get more data and, and analyze more variables. You know, it can lead to what we call uh, analysis paralysis. But when the global economy and those variables that impact your own business are changing really rapidly as they are now, do you really have the time to wait for more data or deeper analysis? Or, or worse, can you afford to sit on the analysis that's readily at hand? You know, probably not if you want to survive or even thrive in, in times like these. Um, and even while it may seem like you're being cautious, it can actually have a, a serious negative and lasting impact on your project or your business. So, um, as you're probably you know, aware, analysis paralysis can lead to any number of issues, such as things like lost opportunities or uh, lost time to market, lost market share, losing the trust of employees and partners, um, failed projects or businesses, and, and even the loss of life, as you know, we've already seen by countries whose leaders and you know, processes have you know, been paralyzed for one reason or another, um, or even made decisions while ignoring uh, available data. Right, right now, none of us can really afford anything these things to happen to our business um, business this year. So, in an uncertain global market like what we're experiencing as a result of the fallout from the coronavirus and, and recent, uh, even the recent you know, OPEC uh, situation, you know, what do inexperienced or unnerved business leaders tend to do? Well, they do things like they hunker down, or they tighten the belt, or they jettison the ballast or, or worse they just you know stay the course because they're strategically paralyzed however what we find is more experienced and steely leaders um, will take to heart what um, uh, mf weiner first wrote uh, coincidentally in a in a 1976 medical journal he said that don't waste a crisis and i know that theme has been picked up on by folks like um, um rama Emanuel and, and and others but how does one understand a crisis and anticipate and take advantage of its ramifications well in one word data true most crises are are unique and remain really unpredictable in a lot of ways and and certainly these are are great times of uncertainty so while it may take make sense to push the pause button on particular capital expenditures um, we at Caserta believe that investments in data and analytics should be accelerated not abated at, at times like this um, so let's talk for a moment about, about uncertainty. True, most crises are unique and, and remain unpredictable in a lot of ways, uh, and these are definitely times of great uncertainty. Certainty, or at least a you know, degree of it being you know, predictable activity, can always be gleaned from a, you know, what's called a deterministic chain of, of responses and, and certainly taken advantage of. And in fact, the, the definition of information itself dating back to the days of the father of information theory, Claude Shannon, um, who, who I relied a lot on in, in the work that I did on, on infonomics, he specifically cites it as being that which reduces uncertainty leading to chaos. That's the definition of information. That which reduces uncertainty leading to chaos, that is the effects of, of entropy. So you don't really need to understand Shannon's seminal formula here that led to revolutionary advances in things like communication and data compression, um, to understand how more accurate and complete and faster and integrated uh, and unique information can be used to improve business processes or decisions. However, we do need to keep in mind that increasingly decisions are, are made not by humans, but by machines. So as I wrote in my Infonomics book, 
we really need to start by architecting systems to deliver information in new ways that take advantage of technology's ability to consume information in ways that humans cannot. Now, we still find a lot of companies focusing on building, you know, pie charts and bar charts and doing, you know, analysis like that, that is directed toward eyeballs. And, you know, our contention is that increasingly the primary consumers of information are machines and technologies and applications, not humans. So we need to rethink those data architectures and the way that we're delivering information, the type of analytics that we're delivering to, um, to those systems. All right, I think we're going to go. So um, when we look at you know, economics, land, labor, and capital, um, you know, as factors of production were originally identified by the early political economists like Adam Smith and um, David Ricardo and Karl Marx, but today most economist textbooks still claim that capital and labor remain the two primary inputs for the productive process and, um, and, and the, the generation of profits by, by businesses. However, as we've seen in the past couple of decades, good data in its many forms, including analytics and insights and predictions and diagnoses and prescriptive analytics and cognitive analytics and so forth, you know, it's all, all has become a lower cost substitute for inventory, property, and even money. You know, for example, Uber and Lyft, of course, have substituted information about who needs a ride and who has a car in, in, to replace fleets of taxis. Similarly, you know, Airbnb and HomeAway have done the same thing for inventories of bedrooms. Um, and even most retailers and manufacturers have been able to reduce their inventory levels, um, some to just-in-time inventory, based on detailed or, or near real-time supply and demand information. And in fact, uh, just, just a, a side note here, uh, I was just at our, our local uh, grocery store. Uh, if you've got kids home from school and want to let them out, they are scrambling to find help for um, stocking shelves in, in the evenings. So um, keep that in mind if you're, you're, your kids are looking for some, uh, some income here quick. Um, all right, so the next slide, what we're going to talk about uh, supply. And um, speaking of supply, you know, um, the question is how, how well does, you know, do you really understand your supply chain? A lot of people will say, well, of course we know who our suppliers are, but you know their production capacities or costs at different levels of capacity. Do you know who their, who their suppliers are or who their supplier suppliers are and you know, how resilient those businesses are to changing economic you know, conditions like we're experiencing right now? You know, most automakers and airline manufacturers have up to six levels or more supply chain visibility, or what a lot of people call today um, in, in the business, N-tier visibility. So if you don't have this kind of information, we would recommend collecting it or buying it or bartering for it, you know, uh, exchanging information in return for goods and services, um, and plug that into your value chain model. Furthermore, you know, the question is, how well have you used available information to identify and then up alternate suppliers in the event that one falters or can't, you know, deliver you with it um, because its borders are closed uh, or because workers have been quarantined or transportation methods are, are halted? Or what if one of your supplier suppliers has just been flagged for human rights issues? Will you be among the first or will you be among the last to, to know? Um, company uh, financial and operational risk levels from things like unclear visibility into your supply base are as high as an investor's uh, investing in mutual funds without knowing diversity in their investment portfolio. So the same thing with, um, with demand. Uh, how well are you tracking customer sentiment, uh, the per their purchasing power, uh, competitor pricing or service changes and how that impacts customer sentiment or demand, uh, or any hundreds or thousands of global economic factors affecting demand for your goods and services in real time or over some you know, extended horizon. Um, a growing selection of, of data product companies and data marketplaces and specialized analytic solution pro providers have emerged and, and they offer an array of alternative data sources that can provide really unique insights if integrated well. One example comes from a, a major uh, beer company who was having trouble predicting uh, before the crisis, you know, predicting um, beer sales in, in China. And they found that their, the accuracy of their forecast was only about 75% accurate. And so they turned to a, a, a provider of, of um, 
uh, of global insights and, and analytics on, on global indicators, a company called Prevedere Software. And Prevedere helped them un understand which of the thousands or tens of thousands of, of relevant indicators are actually predictors of demand for, for beer sales in, in China. And with that in hand, they were able to upgrade their forecast from 75% accuracy to 95% accuracy, which will help them stop from you know, spilling beer or you know, leaving, leaving money on the table. So you know, the lesson here is that one signal or even just a handful of signals is very you know, 2005, um, as is just using data that uh, is about, you know, as is data that your own, gener your own business generates, um, you really need to look outside for um, additional data sources from um, these uh, data marketplace vendors like DAOX or data providers like Eagle Alpha or, um, or um, um, many other kinds of, of, of data providers. So most of us you know, by now have experienced the convenience of things like online banking, snapping photos of, uh, of and depositing checks from home or making NFC payments with our phones. Um, sending money instantly using Venmo or Zelle or PayPal, um, or even making donations directly through Facebook or, or Instagram, or even you know, apply for jobs or receive uh, CVs via LinkedIn, um, and even today holding meetings remotely. So data can, is something that can transport us you know, to the gym, to the bank, to the store, or even to a museum. A lot of museums have virtual tours right now that, that people are, are taking while they're, they're stuck at home. Um, or rather, you know, these systems can transport these, these, um, these places to, to us. Increasingly, people are choosing to you know, work out like at home at the gym with other, you know, uh, other, you know virtually at home. And um, for example, with a monthly membership to a, a program called Varus, you can get, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, you can get you know, unlimited on-demand access to brands like you know, Equinox and SoulCycle and, and Headstrong and Pure Yoga. Each class um, is this you know, uh, immersive kind of cinematic uh, experience that's brought to you via multi-camera shots and you know, concert great lighting and, and it closely as much as possible mirrors the in-studio experience of these brands. So this app will kind of transport you to the, you know, the front row of the class from really anywhere that, that you are now. And when you kind of want to sweat it out with your favorite instructors, your slot is, you know, is always available. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, Caserta actually built the backend data architecture and integration for this uh, Veris application. And in the past week, we've seen other fitness companies like Orange Theory start to offer uh, remote classes and instruction as well. So especially with the, the recent you know, trepidation of gatherings and spreading disease through the handling of objects, uh, you, know, you might consider which of your physical products um, at your, your company and you know, mano a mano kinds of services can be digitalized. Digitalization, of course, requires data too and, and lots of it. Um, case in point, um, and I'll share what, something that we're doing here. Um, we're involved in the upcoming uh, Infonomics and Data Governance Summit, which we had planned to hold in Boston next month. But instead of canceling or postponing the event, as most have done uh, with their events, we've opted to use uh, a platform called Verbella, uh, V-I-R-B-E-L-A. It's an immersive 3D virtual conference center experience, and it enables attendees to create their own you know, animated avatar. You can roam around the conference facility, attend lectures, uh, break out to small meetings, have uh, voice chat with those in the vicinity. Um, it also enables presenters to upload and share presentations live with the audience. Um, and there's even like a beach and a soccer field where you can kick around a soccer ball, you know, if one of the, the presentations uh, <laughs> sucks. <laughs> so, um, so the question is, you know, are you canceling your user conferences or your upcoming you know, company meeting? Perhaps you should be looking for an alternative, you know, collaborative and even morale boosting kind of workspace for your employees beyond something like, you know, Zoom or WebEx or whatever. And, and you know, of course, if you have no events to attend in April, well, well we certainly invite you to join the, uh, the Infonomics and, and Data Governance Summit information about that on our, our website. Um, so speaking of 3D, um, data-fueled 3D printing has enabled companies like GE to make parts for uh, its new engine. The new engine is called the Leap Engine. And with 3D printing, they can print 19 parts um, produced in a single print, and uh, they're actually five times stronger than the way they used to produce them. It's the first passenger jet, jet engine to use 3D printed fuel nozzles 
and where each of these parts used to be uh, separately machined and then fused together um, to construct the, the passageways of the, the nozzles. There's now only one piece that's built up by layering this powdered metals and melted and fused together through uh, what's called direct metal laser melting. Um, and it, it actually makes each nozzle five times stronger than those made through milling or welding or other what are called subtractive uh, manufacturing processes. So you know, perhaps now is the time to consider how to take the time and expense out of your manufa manufacturing while actually improving the quality via, um, via um, 3D printing. Um, so there are also these things like products that are can service themselves. And one quick example of this is um, a Joy Global. It's a Fortune 1000 company that manufactures and services heavy machinery used in underground um, and surface mining. The company also deals in um, aftermarket parts. And so by installing sensors in their machines, they can notify their customers when the machines need replacement parts or, or service. There are a lot of examples of companies like this today, all you know, connected over the uh, internet of things. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, the, the Mexican oil refinery, Pemex, who uh, had, had some issues some years ago with uh, equipment throughout the refinery sh uh, breaking down and shutting down the entire you know, refining process. And so they asked their engineers, you know, what is it, how, how can we predict when a certain um, component of the refinery is about to fail? And the, the engineer said, said oh, I say ruido, it, it makes noise. <laughs> so that's well, kind of obvious. And so you know, what creates noise is vibration. So they put vibration sensors throughout uh, the equipment in the refinery to take baseline readings and then identify when equipment is getting out of spec and, uh, and be more proactive in, in, in fixing it. So they've been able to uh, improve uptime by a thousand hours a year of the, the refinery you know, through those kinds of sensors. So um, again, if you're looking for a way to kind of save costs through analytics um, in, in servicing equipment, um, you know, take a page out of, out of these books. Okay. Um, so data can also be used to identify and understand customers, not just equipment, or even folks that you don't want as a customer. Um, an interesting example of this is when Taylor Swift played the uh, Rose Bowl, um, I think last year in May, a kiosk was set up for her uh, adoring fans to view videos of her. Um, but it seems that there was a little bit more to the screen than uh, met the eye. The somewhat innocent looking kiosk also took photos of people who were looking at the videos and the images were sent back to a, a command post in, in Nashville where um, her security people cross-referenced using facial recognition I guess a database of people who had been identified as, as uh, stalkers or potential stalkers of the, the, the pop star and then alerting on-site security personnel to kind of keep an eye on, on these folks. Or perhaps a more positive example, consider a Burberry who's Salespeople um, are armed with tablets that alert them to known customers as soon as they enter the store. Um, they're alerted to um, the customer's previous orders, uh, returns, and preferences. And, and moreover, when, when a customer holds up or tries on an item, Burberry has these smart mirrors that can tell the customer about the item, including its materials, uses, and whether um, whether it's available in the customer size and, and preferred colors. So there's some really great examples of using data to further engage customers in, in a combined sort of digital on-prem um, uh, in-store uh, manner. So today, it's, it's kind of hard to go you know, a week uh, without hearing a consultant or a pundit talk about the intersection of uh, you know, the old people, process, and technology. Uh, you can probably guess what you know, we believe is missing um, data. The uh, question is, how, how in the world today can any organization understand its value chain without understanding the flow of data? Uh, TV detectives, you know, for example, always you know, talk about uh, following the money. Well, I think it's just as important today to, to be able to understand the way that a business operates to be able to follow the, the data. So uh, an interesting example of this is uh, combining the, these familiar relationships among people, process, technology, and data. We can you know, define our business and clearly understand the relationships that drive value, the, the value chain. And what this does is it enables us to model um, tweaks or even reinvent aspects of our business to, to measure their, their impact. In this way, an organization can invest thousands of dollars in modeling this um, before committing to millions of dollars. Um, 
uh, even the, the financial value of the data itself can be determined using this kind of approach. So uh, one example is a leading broadband provider in the U.S. who has an extensive um, portfolio of advanced uh, services like high-speed internet, data and voice, and cloud, cable, and so forth. So they used a modeling tool called Link, L-I-N-Q, out of uh, New Zealand. And uh, their website, if you want to check them out, is link, uh, L-I-N-Q dot I-T, I believe. Um, so what they did was they created a digital twin of this hosted uh, voice over IP sales and deployment process, and it helped the company easily identify the inefficiencies and quantify their impact. And by modeling the value chain in this way, they were able to find things like incomplete orders and you know, why they happen, manual data entry, uh, manual customer touch points, and all of this revealed the true operating cost of delivering this hosted voice over IP solution. Uh, so what they did next was they used this modeling tool to build a future state model, um, identifying the process changes and technology solutions that would realize, uh, ultimately would realize an annual cost savings of over uh, a million uh, million dollars. Data, um, of course, is, is necessary to give visibility to executives so that they can act with more precision, especially in a, in a volatile market like this. But so basic hindsight oriented analytics, even from things like you know pretty pie charts and beautiful bar charts or dashing dashboards, uh, you know we find just rarely provides the necessary insights or moves the needle on businesses. Over the years, I've collected um, over 500 examples of how organizations are using analytics uh, and, and data in innovative and high value ways, which is where we get a lot of these ideas from. Um, but um, you know what we find is that almost none of them, maybe. I was talking about hindsight-oriented uh, analytics models, and, and in this library that we've compiled, almost none of them have anything to do with hindsight-oriented oriented analytics. The real high-value propositions come from the more advanced, um, more advanced, uh, forward-looking analytics. Um, I want to share also something with you. Uh, back while I was uh, a Gartner analyst, uh, some of my colleagues, Dale Petnick and Saul Brand, developed this con really cool concept of uh, what, what they call an economic architecture. So an economic architecture is this a brilliant method of defining an organization's uh, prospective uh, aspirational balance sheet and income statement, and then architecting the business to achieve uh, to achieve it over some kind of time horizon. So think about it. Rather than architecting your business, you architect the balance sheet and the financial statements, and then make the business model changes to be able to achieve that balance sheet over some time horizon. And so as economic conditions change, so much various financial goals and, and ratios that in turn they, you know, they dictate how the business must operate to achieve them. Especially today, this method can help organizations better define the shape of their company after this global crisis. How are you going to come out of this global crisis? What does that balance sheet and that financial statement going to look like next year? Um, and then uh, um, start to architect the business to achieve that. You know, this is you know, rather than letting the crisis define the shape of their uh, company itself, you know, let the um, shape of their company define what they want to look like after the global global crisis. Another interesting story that I was involved in um, uh, some years ago, I was with BMC Software, and I was really impressed with the way the the executives there handled um, the onset of the the Great Recession, or what we might be calling soon the first Great Recession. Um, it was one company whose leaders went really kind of a step further beyond this this simple um, single economic architecture concept, uh, they developed a series of financial risk scenarios. Um, they color coded them red, green, yellow, blue, purple, et cetera, based on economic triggers that they were ready to execute upon at a moment's notice. Um, so rather than waiting for something to happen and saying, okay, now how should we react? They set up a set of, of, of scenarios um, using analytics and, and data to identify you know, what was kind of the likelihood of each of those scenarios and what should we do based on each of those triggers. So as a result, the company, you know, what we found was really able to weather the storm a lot better than others, not just be, by being um, proactively reactive or whatever you want to call it, but by instilling confidence in its employees, um, its customers, and its investors. So the ability to define and communicate and execute efficiently to uh, economically architect a business or employ economic scenarios really, you know, of course, requires a lot of deep and, and broad data and analytics as well. So something important, I think, for today. So Tobin's Q, 
Tobin's Q is a simple ratio that not a lot of people know about. It was posited by Nobel laureate um, and American economist James Tobin back in the 1960s. He developed it to uh, better understand the relationship between a company's market value and the replacement cost of its tangible of its tangible uh, assets. Um, what we saw in doing an analysis is that this quotient has been um, growing since the financial statements were standardized following the, the Great Depression. Uh, Tobin's Q has more than doubled in, uh, on average for companies since 1945. And in fact, this ratio seems to have tripped in favor of market value over tangible asset costs. Um, ironically, or coincidentally, about the same time as data warehousing and business intelligence rose to prominence in the, uh, you know, around the mid to late 1990s. Um, moreover, a, a study that I performed also found companies demonstrating information savvy behavior like um, hiring chief data officers or um, standing up data science organizations or launching enterprise data governance programs they tend to have a Q value or Tobin's Q nearly two times greater than the market average. And little surprise, um, you know, uh, as they do more with fewer tangible assets, information-based businesses like data brokers and uh, social media companies, they tend to have a, a Q value nearly three times greater than the market average. So there's something that investors, you know, tend to notice um, about these information savvy and information kinds of product companies. So, you know, now might be a good time to consider you know, how do you become a more information savvy and, or maybe even start to offer information kinds of products um, as a complement to um, your traditional products and services today. So let's talk about data as a product for, for a sec. Um, and, and this is the last of, of the ideas we'll, we'll cover. You know, there's really no, no better time than now to consider how to productize your, your data assets. And uh, a lot of the work that we're doing at Caserta today is helping organizations understand how to generate more economic value from their data, both internally, um, but also externally. How can they barter or trade it with others and so forth? Um, you know, for now, if only to, diverse, to diversify, while demand for your traditional products and services may have, uh, have waned a bit, uh, identifying ways to package and license your data and insights about your customers or markets or suppliers or your products and services themselves could, in fact, generate some much needed revenue. Um, actually, 30% of companies today, we find, are already directly monetizing their data externally in these ways by bartering or exchanging it, um, by selling it to others, by packaging it up into analytics and making that available. So, you know, keep in mind that monetizing data doesn't necessarily mean selling it. It's all about generating measurable economic value from, from your data. Um, and uh, you know, we've discussed this in previous Caserta webinars that you can check out on, on our site. Um, so you know, like, there are a variety of ways to generate this measurable economic value. Uh, and not only from your data, there's plenty of data out there from others to be gathered and integrated and, and monetized as well. Remember, it's important to remember that data, uh, this is really kind of a core tenet of, of our strategy work with companies on, on data and analytics, uh, to remember that data is what economists call a, a non-rivalrous, non-depleting, and regenerative asset. This means that it can, can and should be used multiple ways simultaneously. It can be used again and again, and whenever you're using data, new, genera new data can be generated about the processes that are using that original data. So you know, this is how you can generate orders of magnitude higher returns on your information assets by taking into consideration these concepts of the reusability and repeated usability um, and regeneratability, that's a word, of, of your, uh, your data assets. So I just want to finalize with some recommendations and then we'll, we can take some uh, questions. Um, and I'd love to hear from folks on you know, other ways that you can see data and analytics being used in innovative and, and, and high value ways. Um, you know, inevitably, CIOs um, and other business and, and data and technology leaders uh, over the next few weeks are going to be asked to reconsider their IT budgets um, in the midst of this you know, current financial crisis and, and learn from those companies that weathered and, and thrived in the last one. So you know, our recommendation is rather than slashing budgets wholesale, you know, consider shifting them into improved ways to manage and leverage data as an actual corporate asset uh, and stop thinking about it as an expense. You know, or bolder yet, ask for increased budget to bring uh, data to the rescue. So um, I'm going to wrap up here and um, just thank you all for joining us today. 
Uh, we really appreciate your time. And of course, you know, we at Caserta look forward to supporting you on your data and analytics journey in, in any way, either your short term, helping you with uh, things that are pressing right right now related to data and analytics or, um, or long term, you know, just as we have for the past, uh, past 20 years. So Remy, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and, and see uh, what questions we might have or comments from anyone on what they see their organizations or others doing to help use data and analytics to buff it against uh, you know, what's happening in the, in the global economy today. Sure thing. First of all, thank you, Doug, for this insightful webinar. Uh, I think you touched sure. on a lot of great points. Uh, everyone, thank you for joining us today. There is a questions panel in the uh, go to webinar control panel on your right. And if you could enter them there, we will get to some of the juicier ones that we have time for. And if we don't, then we can uh, answer your emails. So please ask, uh, put your questions there. I will start with uh, one of the earlier ones. Uh, Doug, will you mm -hmm. please elaborate more on the six tiers of information? <laughs> on the, the six tiers? Yes. Oh, the supply chain? I believe that's what the show notes. So, yeah, yeah. So I think you're talking about the supply chain. So um, major manufacturers want to know, want to have visibility into their supplier's um, um, supply of, of goods and services that they're using to build cars or, or airplanes or, or whatever. But that's not enough. Um, these suppliers are generating subassemblies that take other materials from other suppliers. And for a lot of complex, you know, sophisticated types of equipment, like cars and planes, there's this uh, um, very complex um, um, multi-level supply chain. And um, there's been you know, a bit written about how these organizations have supply chain visibility into the, um, the availability of supply, the availability to uh, ramp up, uh, to, to create supply, um, um, alternate suppliers, and so forth. So the, the concept has become, rather than specifying a number of supply um, levels of supply that are, are, are visible, they're calling it N tier. Uh, the letter N and then tier supply chain. So I think that that answers it. There are even some some vendors out there, some data vendors that can help you understand the viability um, of, of suppliers as well. All right. This one isn't so much a question as an observation, but I, mm. I'd actually like for you to Great. chime in on this one. Uh, sure. Writes, the challenge is that understanding demand during times like this cannot be done just using existing data. There needs to be some understanding or a model of the volatility that will occur. And most traditional models will not reflect this phenomenon. No doubt. A lot of traditional models will consider this a black swan and, um, and, and uh, you know, eliminate that data from the model. So it's important to go back and look at what were some of the leading indicators of, uh, of demand. Uh, and I know demand is a, a of the most interest um, in situations where there were major corrections or, or previous recessions or whatnot, what were the leading indicators of demand for certain kinds of products and services? Um, I know we're a little bit different here because this is more of a, a, a you know, biological uh, um, um, inspired <laughs> um, uh, economic crisis, but um, there are certain industries that um, are, are going to survive and even thrive in this, and uh, it's important to understand what those the, those leading indicators are and, and, and why. Um, so rather than looking at you know historical averages or or standard models, going back and looking at um, what happened during times of, of prior crisis can be really instructive. All right, um, what are the risks of productizing a company's own data? Yes, yeah, so there are a number of risks in, 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 in that. One is you're exposing uh, a lot about your company that you don't need to expose, perhaps. Um, right now, because data isn't a balance sheet asset, um, you don't need to report on what data you have or how you're using it or, or any of that. In fact, you can use it as a resource, as an asset, um, in ways that you can't use other resources because um, it's invisible to your competitors um, for, for the most part. So that's a really exciting thing about data not being a balance sheet asset. But yes, there are risks involved and in, you know, you start to expose a bit about your business when you are using or sharing data um, externally. Um, but it's fairly easy to kind of control, control it um, if you're only exchanging data with say partners or suppliers um, or folks like that. And, and you know, anything that you can do right now to help your suppliers understand your own demand can be really valuable to them. And you know, they might even exchange, I'll guarantee, they would exchange data about your demand, um, demand for your products and services, 
uh, they will exchange that for favorable terms and you know commercial terms and conditions. And we see this happening all the time right now. I mean, take a just a a, a, a standard you know B to C um, scenario where you go into the grocery store and you scan your loyalty card. Uh, you're exchanging, you know, we call that getting a discount, right? But what's really happening is you're exchanging information about you and your purchase for free food, right? That's really what's going on. And so we see this happening more and more in the B2B world where an organization will exchange information about itself, its demand, its, um, its pipelines um, in return for favorable commercial terms from its, uh, its suppliers or partners. So that's something certainly to consider. Um, one of the the, the risks, however, is, of course, in customer data and, and really regulatory um, uh, 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 laws like, like uh, the GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act have really clamped down on an organization's ability to share customer data. Um, however, one of the ways, and I didn't touch on this, but it was on that slide um, on the, the productizing your, your data slide. Remy, if you might want to jump to that, if you can. I um, cannot. It's a different uh, thing right now. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah, no worries. The last one there was on what we call an inverted uh, data monetization. And this is where you know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't, I can't monetize my customer data anymore because of these regulations, these privacy regulations. Well, we think that's bunk. And in fact, they're working with uh, a number of companies on creating um, what we call these inverted data monetization models, where um, um, the scenario is, I can't sell you my data, my customer data, but I can sell your products and services to my customers. So there's no privacy issue with me alerting my, my customers to your products and services. So let's uh, use a hospital as an example. Um, a hospital obviously can't disclose its, its patient data, but what it can disclose is, is uh, information about products and services to particular patients. So say I know who my uh, uh, patients with diabetes are. I can offer them products and services related to uh, healthy living or reduced uh, sugar food items or at-home diagnostic tests that I as the hospital don't offer myself, but I can promote those products to my patients directly and in return, you know, kind of maybe take a cut or, or take some kind of fee from um, those those um, uh, those providers. You, know, you have to get out and be careful of some ethical considerations in there, but um, the legal considerations are, are not really any, any problem whatsoever. I'm not here to give legal advice, but um, certainly um, it doesn't fall into the realm of, of any issues with, with uh, GDPR. Um, so that's really kind of the big thing. You're kind of opening up your, your, your kimono a little bit about your business, and then you know there's certain kinds of data that you really can't expose, but we've come up with ways for organizations to be able to monetize their data in this inverted, um, inverted kind, of, kind of model. Sorry if that rambled a bit. That's okay. <laughs> Happy to talk to anyone about it. <laughs> uh, the next one is, uh, if stuff. data leaders anticipate hiring freezes uh, due to the current situation, yeah. do you think companies mm -hmm. will look to reskill or upskill existing team members in order to find mm -hmm. data talent? Or yeah, it's a one of those. Like um, sure. Yeah. It's one of those, you know, do more with less scenarios. So I think you know the first thing we'll see is obviously hiring freezes, and then we'll see certain uh, aspects of the business being being divested in, and 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 labor being divested as well. You know the good news is that there's companies out there that are hiring, hiring like crazy to uh, keep up with the, the the demand for for particular products and services. Now I think Amazon just you know announced that they're hiring a, a hundred thousand people to help with uh, with with uh, delivery and, and warehouses. So um, there are going to be some winners and losers here uh, as well. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, I think, you know, filling the void, um, as we start to look at the upswing, um, I think, you know, consulting firms will be really well positioned, you know, to kind of fill that gap while companies consider where and when to, um, staff, you know, full-time, uh, full-time employees, uh, in, in the IT space. All right. And this is the last question yeah. we're going to ask. Uh, sure. Do you see certain commercial verticals, and I think you touched on this before uh, with healthcare, but do you see certain commercial verticals that have taken the lead in marketing and selling their data, especially at a time like this? Would you comment on the maturity, yeah. especially of the travel market, so key at this time under so much pressure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the travel market obviously is under a lot of pressure right now. Um, hopefully, there's some pent up demand for holidays, uh, you know, after everybody's kind of stuck at home. So, you know, I would encourage the um, in the travel industry to start reaching out to um, individuals or you know folks in their customer base to say listen you know we understand that uh, you know right now 
you're, uh, you know, there are travel restrictions in place and, and uh, you know, um, you're saying you might be looking for some more, um, uh, you know, cheaper, you know, less expensive um, destinations you know, coming out of this. And so what, what are those kinds of things that you might be looking for? Are you looking for more, you know, driving trips or local trips? So, you know, rather than selling people on, you know, Caribbean adventures, maybe identify that, you know, hey, I live in Chicago and, you know, uh, a few hours away is the Wisconsin Dells, and we're going to offer you, you know, a trip uh, to the Wisconsin Dells. Um, maybe even buy it now for some kind of discount, and, uh, and we'll, we'll send you up there when the, the travel you know, restrictions are lifted. So, um, I think it's important that you get, get with your customers and take their temperature to um, understand how their demand has shifted, and even get them to think forward. You know, as these restrictions are, are lifted and the economy starts to pick back up, what new kinds of um, products and services are they going to be looking for um, instead of the, the ones that perhaps they were buying before uh, b before this crisis. So, and that, that goes with every industry. Um, the, the companies in general that tend to monetize their, their data the best are, are those who have a relationship with a customer where their suppliers do not. So think about any manufacturer or retail has a direct relationship with a customer. They know who the customers are. Um, they know their buying patterns. They know their shop. They can do shopping basket analysis. Um, they can do sentiment analysis, and they can make all of that available to the manufacturers who uh, are desperate for information about how to um, not only how to supply, but how to provide products and services that meet the, the quality and performance and you know, usage characteristics that are you know emerging and changing. So you know we're doing some work right now with a company, um, I'll just say in, in the pharmaceutical industry, to help its, um, its suppliers understand demand and, and uh, all sorts of detailed data um, that will help them um, you know, manage their own businesses better. All right, thank you very much, Doug. So thank you I, I think my coming. general advice there is, Go yeah, for I it. was gonna say my general advice is you know, look around your, your, your extended um, uh, business ecosystem. You know, who are the players in your ecosystem and what data do you have? That they could use and value in, in various ways, um, and I'll say that you know Gar uh, that, um, that that Caserta has a definitive process for how to go about this. We have a data monetization or information innovation uh, approach that we use with clients to help walk them through this process and, and develop ideas um, and then implement them. All right, thank you very much. And if we didn't get to any of your questions, sure. um, I'm going to email each of you a recording of the webinar. And if you have any questions, you can please respond and we would be more than glad to help you navigate these choppy waters. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Take care. Be well, everyone.